Hi, Doug. It's so good to see you again. Thanks for coming to, it's now called the week's well, not practice well. <laughs> yeah. Your, you know, conversation we had uh, last fall, sometime October maybe, remains one of our most popular podcasts. And that's why I wanted to bring you back. Um, well, we already decided that before we saw your conver our conversation trending, um, because we left a lot of things on the table in that last conversation because there's just so much to discuss when we are splicing out and trying to understand and contextualize the practice of modern yoga. And one of the things that's so great about learning from you and talking to you is your academic and philosophical background uh, about this matter, <laughs> this subject. And so as we, before we clicked record, we were talking about the and. I mean, I do. I think we're in a century of butt slash and. You know, we have the initial clause, and then there's this kind of thing in between, and we're really filling out what's on the other side of it. And so, any even half serious reading of the Yoga Sutras leaves one to know or understand that the recommendation in that text and the four padas and the four chapters is to remove oneself from the world because the world, Prakriti, is something that needs to be um, understood as invalid or is as- You're not gonna change it. It's gonna be what it's gonna be. And there's nothing that we do is, that's gonna change the nature of Prakriti whose nature is to constantly change. Mm. Uh, it grows, it deteriorates, I mean, uh, you can't change the course of the world. So especially his value system, his ethics, is not concerned with improving the world because basically there's this, an assumption that you can't or you won't. And if you get involved in your attempt to improve the world or change the world, you'll just get dragged down with it. Hmm. Uh, so there's really no value in doing that. And he's, he's, and he's very clear in his logic behind the ethics. His ethics are not to make the world a better place, though if we did follow that system, even that simple system of ethics, if everybody followed it, yes, the world would be a better place, but he's not hes not suggesting that that is something that will actually happen. Um, hmm. You follow the ethics to actually distance yourself from or remove yourself from the influence of the world and its influence over you and your patterns of thinking. And, you know, one of the things we talked about a lot in the last conversation is Patanjali's text being a cohering, almost convening, intersecting place of other theories at the time around enlightenment. Could we just use that word? Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. for sure. Um, so, Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I recently saw somebody advertising a philosophy course uh, saying that Patanjali Yoga Sutras are the foundational text of yoga. That's what I'm everybody like, says. Yeah, I'm like, okay, I understand saying that. At the same time, the Yoga Sutras are just a moment in time. I mean, you had centuries and centuries before that setting up ideas in the Upanishads, uh, some of which are reflected in Patanjali and many of which are not taken up or discussed at all in Patanjali. Uh, and so he's syncretistic in the sense that he's bringing together a variety of ideas about practice. And the bulk of his sutras are actually more concerned with prevent, presenting his theory of how all of this works. He's telling you more right. about how the mind works and saying, yes, meditation and the Ashtanga path, the Eightfold Path, is the means to dealing with the problems caused by the mind, but he tells he spends more time explaining how the mind works than how you actually put these things into practice. For instance, pranayama out of 195 sutras, he has about five sutras on pranayama, which are pretty, and none, none of it is about how to actually do it. There's even less discussing how you do asana. And of course, there's the yamas and niyamas. Uh, and the yamas and niyamas, uh, Christopher Chapel, who's a scholar of Eastern thought, said the yamas and niyamas have much more uh, similarity or relationship to the Jain system of spirituality. And Jainism evolved at the same time as Buddhism. Mahavira was the founder of the Jain 
spirituality, and he lived about the same time as the Buddha. And it was a severely ascetic approach to spirituality where ahimsa was taken, nonviolence was taken in the absolute literal sense. You did everything possible to minimize harm done to any any creature, even microscopic life or insects. So that so it was it was ahimsa taken to the max. And of course Buddhism sought more of a middle path, uh, avoiding extremes. But the Yamas and Niyamas and Patanjali bear far more resemblance to the Jain system of ascetic ethics uh, than certainly to any system of ethics that you find, for instance, in the Vedas or the Mahabharata. And so, so he's pulling together those ideas. If you look at the structure of his book, um, his first discussion of practice gives examples of how you might practice. So when he's talking about uh, the different things like seeing, you know, being happy for the virtuous and indifferent towards the wicked, uh, contemplation of Om, those that he kind of lumps together in, in one or two sutras, he's mm -hmm. kind of listing possibilities of things that people practice as an approach to uh, calming the mind or approaching the mind in the way he's discussing. It's not until the next part of that he actually gets into a systematic approach to how the Ashtanga path gives you a whole program for dealing with the mind in, in a comprehensive way. But he's pulling together many ideas from many different systems of practice and not so much from the Vedic spirituality. There was one reference to a writer back in Patanjali's time. I tried to find it and I couldn't, but one Vedic writer was explicitly saying that Patanjali does not really represent Vedic spirituality. Uh, mm -hmm. And certainly his language and the concepts that he uses are don't don't strongly reflect Vedic spirituality, though, of course, some of the commentators do. And people get confused between sometimes between the actual text of Patanjali and the commentary upon the text, uh, totally. which often involves a different person. But he's syncretistic in the sense that he's pulling together these ideas and developing them into a more coherent, uh, comprehensive system of thought. And there may be some originality in that, especially when he goes into the clashes and the mm -hmm. psychological factors that drive the mind. But largely, he's summarizing what came before. And we're talking about centuries of what came before from mm -hmm. many, many different perspectives. And again, the, the sutras themselves are a moment in time. They were practiced or popular for about 500 years. We know that basically in terms of how many commentaries were written on the Yoga Sutras. And by the time you reach the Patanjali is like fourth century, roughly, our guess. Uh, once you get up, up around the eighth or the ninth century, there's the growth of Tantra, which is providing an alternative to uh, not only the socially driven sort of ethics taught by the Bhagavad Gita, but also a, a sort of rebellion against the approach of Patanjali and taking a new path. And mm -hmm. Tantra was not the only path. But by the 13th century, even before that, you had very, very few texts being written as a commentary in Patanjali, which means people were discussing it less and less. And so yogic spirituality had moved on from there. And certainly the later systems refer back to Patanjali in one way or another, but they're not simply repeating or just elaborating on Patanjali. They're breaking out into very new ideas and going beyond it. So Patanjali is an important, significant moment in time. And our uh, emphasis upon Patanjali is more of a modern phenomenon that started around 18th or 19th century, mm -hmm. particularly as texts started to get uh, translated by the British uh, mm -hmm. in order to disseminate those texts, both within London and within the world in general. The guy who first started translating the, Santrix, uh, the Tantric texts was uh, named Henry Thomas Colebrook, and he was part of the British Orientalist Society. And he actually regarded Patanjali as a fanatic. He was not a fan of Patanjali, so this guy is a crazy extremist ascetic. It's only later translators that, that got into translating Patanjali for themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the challenge that they met was they wanted to find pundits in India to give an interpretation and translation of Patanjali so it would be accurate. 
but they couldn't find any pundits who actually practiced Patanjali yoga. And when they talked to these pundits, it was always a mishmash of some things from Patanjali, some things from the Bhagavad Gita, and other things from Vedanta all kind of mashed together. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. didn't it didn't closely reflect uh, a direct literal interpretation or translation of Patanjali itself. So the British were left to their own devices. Uh, one translator did find a pundit that said, yes, I will give you an authentic translation of Patanjali, but you have to do seva for me. In other words, you have to live in my house for the next 10 years, and after 10 years of service, then I'll translate it for you. And the, <laughs> the British guy said, thanks, but no thanks. I don't think I'll commit. It's like, I mean, that's actually, I mean, I that story is kind of crazy because it's like the inverse of appropriation. That's basically a South Asian saying, yeah. Actually, I'll do this for you if you serve me, and then I'll give you this yeah. thing because it'll be kind of an equal exchange. And of course, yeah. I hate to say it, but the Brit was like, no, that's no, okay. <laughs> I'm yeah, in no. the dominant class, so you're welcome. Yeah, and how the <laughs> you know? Sanskrit texts were uh, translated and the preferences that the scholars had for the translators, uh, translations, and how the translations were, were received, both within European philosophy which is very prevalent at the time, prevalent at the time, which Hegel, Hegel and the others, and also American philosophers like Emerson and Thoreau, mm -hmm. how they took this in and interpreted it in a practical way was in turn influential upon the reformists in India. So the thinkers mm -hmm. in India behind Neo Vedanta were influenced by how the teachings were received by the West, and then that was reflected back in. Within India, within India, in the movements for social reform, how can we mm. change society for the better? So there was a mutual sort of mirroring of understanding, and Patanjali got pulled into that. I think largely because it was a more straightforward, simple philosophy. A mm. lot of the thought is a lot more along the lines of Aristotle's understanding of virtue and other things. So it was a little bit easier for the Western mind to uh, absorb and interpret in a practical way. And so that was adopted by people like, for instance, Swami Vivekananda, who comes to the United States in 1893 to lecture at the conference, the Chicago conference. And he basically blends together ideas from Patanjali with ideas from the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, esoteric ideas of the chakras. And he also had incorporated the sort of Western esotericism of the time uh, and it all seemed to come together in, into a nice bundle for Vivekananda. But that made for a lot of confusion of ideas that didn't really accurately represent Patanjali. And, and Vivekananda even wrote the book called Raja Yoga, which the first half was his translation of Patanjali. And he was versed in Sanskrit, so he knew what he was doing. And the second half was his lectures given in the West. But, of course, his translation was interpretive with a lot of commentary. And so it gave this impression of Patanjali Yoga as being very acceptable to modern life and the modern, line, uh, modern mind and can be incorporated into modern living. Even though, as you were saying earlier, the whole bent of Patanjali's philosophy is very ascetic, saying you can only succeed in achieving samadhi by withdrawing from the world and, in essence, withdrawing from the influence of prakriti, of material nature, which includes people's ideas and peop how people think and all of the influence of these vrittis uh, upon us. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to I wanna pin a couple of things because it's interesting, this idea of Vivekananda coming to the United States, able to speak English because of colonialism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and able to um, present a set of theories that he called yoga, right? He said like, hi, yeah. I'm a yogi and this is yoga. And that was a relatively new concept for everybody in the United States yeah. at that time. And he chose to, you know, um, bring in several, several ideas, exactly as you're describing, that included the sutras, but because of, you know, the lack of interconnectedness of the world at that time, because of colonialism, because of lack of information flow, I mean, you know, all, because of all the things, there wasn't a place or a way 
for Americans to hear that and say, okay, let's set up, like, let's administer, let's administer the education of these many strands that he has combined. Yeah. And so I wonder, so that le- left us with confusion because it's like, wait, do we, is it the chakras? Is it the Upanishads? Is it, you know, the sutras? Because those are all, as you have yeah. been pointing out, coming from different places. Yeah. And to them, it actually wasn't so confusing because it was all being presented at once. So it was being presented in a way that shows that this right. all fits together and it totally makes sense. Right. And when you go back and read the text, you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> now I'm getting confused. Right. And so that's what I was thinking is that if then he chose to wrote, ra- write Raja Yoga and only chose to plop into the first half of it, the Yoga Sutras, do you think, and we're just sort of speculating here, that, and I don't mean to shred it all the way down to just one part of the second, you know, pada, but the Yamas and Niyamas were a perfect mirror to the, um, uh, can I, oh, I'll have to edit this one out, to the um, Ten Commandments. But <laughs> my, you know, it's just it. It almost seems like the ten and ten was this just instantly easy, very convenient um, mirroring. Yeah. And do you think that that is not only why he did it? Then again, just speculating. But I would also wonder if in modern yoga we pick up on the yamas and niyamas. And I mean, listen, it, it, any YTT two hundred to the extent they even pay attention to the sutras, and I think most do or most try, they are really just like screenshotting a couple of pages from the sutras yeah. and saying, oh yeah, it's first ahimsa, and then it's, you know, and and so, and that's it. And that's, they sort of go on from there. And so I just kind of wonder if that's why the sutras has continued to be so anchored yeah. because it's so simplistic compared to all these other things that not just Vivekananda t- talked about, but also, um, are out there for us to know about yoga, right? I mean, certainly there's the simplicity and straightforwardness because the things hit on in the teacher training are, yes, yoga is the stilling, the calming of the mind. And yamas and niyamas are emphasized a lot, a lot of time is given to following those ethical principles. And there's the eightfold path that includes asana pranayama and leading to samadhi. So there's, there's the method and it leads to samadhi without... And a lot of the ideas about what samadhi is are incorporated from what feels comfortable to us or what comes later, especially with tantric ideas of jivan mukti, of open-eyed samadhi, of living in the world in a state of that awareness, where Patanjali at the end point, there are levels of samadhi because at the end point, you're not in the body anymore because the gunas have no influence over you. Uh, And so, yeah, simple and straightforward. And... Vivekananda was Western educated, so he spoke very uh, compellingly in English. He was very charismatic, and his mind was capable of organizing the, these ideas. And he understood the Western mind enough that he was able to appeal to it. And in some ways, he was sort of the Deepak Chopra of his time uh, because he was incorpor- able to incorporate ideas from science. I mean, this guy hung out with people like Tesla and other people, as well as people in theater. And all of these, the Western esotericism was like, he was just blending it in to basically make the case that what's popular with these with you guys now is spirituality actually reflects what you find in a more grounded sense in the philosophy of yoga or the Vedas. And yes, he, he presents, I mean, he came to the West because he honestly was... Um, looking at generating money for the charities that he was running in India, setting up orphanages. And he, he generally did, genuinely did a lot of important work there. And so that was his primary motivation. But then he made such a splash when he showed up there. He was so charismatic in his speech. Everybody was wrapped with every word. Because like you were saying, with the lack of the kind of information, information flow that we have now, People hadn't heard this stuff before, so it was absolutely bracing. And to have somebody that could mm-hmm. speak them, speak to them in a way that they could hear it was just absolutely thrilling. And then the means of dissemination of this was primarily through his lectures. His lectures got published as books. 
I mentioned that his book was called Raja Yoga, and Raja means to the, the king or the highest yoga. And so the idea of Raja Yoga gets applied to Patanjali, even though that word was never applied to Patanjali in his time. The whole concept of Raja Yoga comes later. It represents the yoga meditation, but it's also a very vague word. Um, it's, it's very hard to pin down. But the Hatha Yoga texts were saying how Hatha Yoga leads to Raja Yoga, the yoga of meditation of Samadhi, with this emphasis on the idea that you could achieve uh, living in that state while in the body in this world and live a normal life. Um, I was going to say something else well, with that, but I forgot. Go ahead. I want to go back to something you were talking about with regard to the authoring of the sutras at the time in you know, Patanjali and how it isn't Vedic and it, it like it, it, it right. Yeah. Okay. So they, the Vedas are the first place that the word yoga is mentioned. Is that right? Okay. Uh, um, in relationship to practice. I mean, the word yoga has a long history in Sanskrit and it's a very right. all encompassing right. word. Uh, but when, as applied to personal practice for spiritual development, that shows up first in uh, the Upanishads. And of course, that word gets adopted by uh, the movements of Buddhism and the other, other Eastern aspects, Eastern India aspects of spirituality, because there is communication between the two sides of the continent. And so right. there's, there's Buddhist yoga and, you know, other forms of yoga. So it comes to be a term that's related to personal practice. Right. So the, okay. So the term yoga then flows from the Upanishads, which predate the sutras yeah. and <clears throat> as a phrase, as a word, sorry, is applied to a variety of communities in communication with one another as the subcontinent is developing from not just the, you know, former Pakistan, but also probably from, well, we're, I, I guess, Pakistan, right? right? Yeah, the history well, is fascinating because, I mean, the, the Vedic culture, um, mm -hmm, as far as we can know from dating, comes from the northwestern part uh, down into India from, from the area of what we call Iran now. And the mm -hmm. derivation of Iran is interesting because it's based upon yes. Aryan or Aryan culture. And this is Aryan culture in the Vedic sense, not in the other associations right. that we have with Aryan. So that's established more in the western part, the northwestern part of India. And over the centuries, that culture has to start to move eastward because of the drying up of the rivers. Just the change, yes. change in the ecology of the area made them move as a farming community. And of course, it developed into an urban community. Meanwhile, you've got the kingdoms in the eastern part of India where Buddhism becomes established. You have Alexander the Great invade India and take over the western part of India and, and persecute the Brahmins to a great degree. Uh, and he established colonies. I mean, Alexander was only in India for a couple of years, then he left and then he died after that. But he left behind Greek colonies that were there and influential for the next 200 years. But essentially, Alexander came in, dominated everything and then left and left a huge power vacuum. And so the kings from the east saw an opportunity, the Mar Mauryan Empire uh, saw an opportunity to go westward and establish or expand their dominion, and they bring the Buddhists and the Jains with them, And which was an interesting partnership because uh, the Jains and the Buddhists were all about renunciation of the world, and so to hang out with kings is an interesting relationship there, but uh, they kind of the king supported them. It provided a spirituality. Ashoka was uh, an extraordinarily brutal emperor who did a lot of conquering. And then I, I don't know if he had a crisis of conscience or what, but he was the one who converted to Buddhism and sort of changed his persona after that. It was at that point that Buddhism became uh, the spirituality that was the primary one supported by these Eastern emperors. Before that, it was the Jains. In any case, part of the communication between Vedic society being pushed eastward because of ecological reasons as well as persecution, encountering 
uh, the spiritualities of the East with ideas such as karma and tra transmigration, which are much more developed by these thinkers. It's only a sense of the afterlife is only vaguely present in the early Vedic texts and really gets clarified once they encounter the idea of karma and reincarnation. And so it gets absorbed into their spirituality. And so, you know, the four goals of life, uh, dharma, karma, uh, I'm forgetting all of them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's on the previous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, liberation, liberation gets added into it uh, as kind of like a, a later addition that comes with that. But in any case, it's like, yeah, there's communication and there's some contact between the cultures prior to Alexander. It's not like that they were totally isolated from each other. Uh, at the same time, the Vedic culture regarded the Eastern cultures as other. They had other traditions. Uh, one of the ways in which they traced the difference was through burial traditions. The burial tradition of the Eastern spiritualities was very different from the Vedic culture of the Western. And so you can kind of locate archaeologically where they were in time. Um, mm -hmm. So, But they were regarded as other because their customs were so other. But over time, the ideas get absorbed and incorporated and kind of work together. I find it interesting. Patanjali, yeah. I find it interesting. Patanjali, he certainly recognizes karma and validates karma, but he really does hardly talks at all about transmigration or concern about the next life. He's really talking about the karma in this life of how our mind develops and how our patterns of thought develop. It's it's like our actions in this life create the karma of our mind, which manifests as the vrittis of the mind. So he's got a very much this moment emphasis upon it instead of worrying about how you set yourself up for the next life. It's really interesting to think about, especially as we kind of, I want to move the, what we're talking about to today, yeah. because sort of that, that space we're filling out on the other side of and, yeah. you know, in the 21st century, and, but I want to say, I think to set that up, it's, it's so interesting to think about the yoga sutras as a play, as an attempt to summarize the best way you can handle your mind in this life, the inside of you, your internal experience, like what it is when you actually do navel gaze or, you know, whatever. And I don't mean to say whatever dismissively, I'm just saying that there's like 10 different kinds of samadhi in the sutras. There's, you know, there's so many different ways to slice the activities of the mind and the suffering therein. Yeah. And so it's just, it's so interesting to observe that, that, that as that is the case, and it has been plopped into the middle of the just, I mean, how can we talk about it any other way is the total commercializing of yeah. the yoga practice. I mean, there, people have in their mind's eye now these images of yogis. It, there's no, I remember I worked with a photographer um, years ago when I first started Boundless Yoga in DC. And he had been in India and was just really interested in taking pictures. And I, and I don't know what the, the name is, but these guys like on the side of the road in loincloths with like, they hadn't shaved forever. They didn't eat much. And they were always had a foot yeah. behind their head. I and mean, it was just really freaky pictures yeah. of men who were obviously not interested in relating to other people because what are you going to do talking to a guy in a loincloth on the side of the road who is relatively emaciated and in something much more dramatic than Padmasana than the Lotus. It's just, they're, 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 that's not an invitation to coffee. Yeah, you know, I mean, if I, if I can share a screen for a moment, I can, I can actually show the pictures that you're referring to or a couple examples. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the pictures that were taken at the time by the British are, this was their example of what the yogi is. And these are weird and creepy people. I mean, yes, next, exactly. as far as, their impression of it, people sitting on beds of nails, emaciated yeah, exactly. like this. And so what I'm actually saying in these slides is the effect of this was that the scholars, including Vivekananda, uh, 
tended to separate the practitioners from the philosophy. They would say, the philosophy is pure, the teachings are pure, but these people in one way or another have become degraded. They're doing these weird ascetic sort of, you know, uh, just weird stuff that they're calling yoga. And they're saying taking that's, it too far. Yeah, yeah, they're taking it too far. And that's, so far. that's not really yoga because everybody else would look at this and say, say, yuck, why would I want to do yoga uh, if I end up, you know, looking like these people? And so uh, for a long time, we do have this phenomenon of a separation between the philosophy and the practitioners, particularly because the practitioners we're looking at here are more related to uh, the tantric tradition than to Patanjali. Patanjali was not saying to, to practice this way. So there's a lot more emphasis upon follow the philosophy of Patanjali, don't pay, atten pay attention to the strange sites that you encounter in India because that's not authentic. And even and I have heard. You know, I've also heard people say that these uh, particular p practitioners, the or these, you know, these people, were also in an, were also um, acting on or exhibiting an attempt to make very extreme the yoga practice in the context of colonialism in order to somewhat protect it from the British. Because the, there was no way the British could, you know, in their mind, understand anything that they were doing, and so the British sort of pushed this practice underground. So these people went further and further underground, including to like sides of the road begging for money or whatever, because they were so disenfranchised, disassociated, and removed from the dominant culture there that was telling them how to live their lives. There was an element of rebellion to it, and actually, right. many of the Hatha yogis became militant guerrillas against the British Empire. I mean, they were they had weapons and they were involved in fighting the British on different levels. So there's certainly an element uh, of rebellion to it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. Sorry, go ahead. And I think to get back to your point also that you wanted to talk about, because we were saying how, uh, again, I'm saying Patanjali is a moment in time. It's a good foundation for practice. I mean, I, I can't really argue with any of the yamas or niyamas because you know, uh, nonviolence, it reflects the same kind of value system that you find even in the Ten Commandments to one degree With Jesus, or another. Yeah. And you run yeah, into this. Old commandment. <laughs> yeah. And so there's, you have that foundation of kind of like a universal foundation of ethics. And at the same time, it's very self-oriented in the sense that it is oriented towards to be true to these ethics means removing yourself from society. Uh, in order to achieve that state of samadhi that, you know, Patanjali is recommending based upon the Samkhya way of thinking. If you don't choose to go that path and you want to be involved in the rest of society, just like Sean Korn was saying, Patanjali gives her a good sense of foundation and she wants to be involved in life. Well, once you start to get involved in the community and other people, it involves recognizing values of community values of how you interact with other people. It's one thing to say, do no harm to others. That's a good ethic. But when you positively relate to people, do no harm is not enough to understand how we relate to people productively, which means you have to incorporate more values to guide you in your behavior relative to other people. And the interesting thing you come up with is on the one hand, you've got a universal set of values that any human being could agree to, like let's say as represented by Patanjali, at least with the Yamas, but the more you start to involve yourself in the community, the more you start to get yourself involved in basically social values, essentially cultural values of interaction. And each culture at each point in history has its own way of relating to each other. And this is their ethics for good behavior. And they can be different without saying one culture's ethics are better than another. This is just, this is how we do it. And so with Patanjali's yamas and niyamas, you've got a total of 10, five yamas, five niyamas. Actually, culturally, they had 10 yamas and 10 niyamas, which were adopted later by the Natha yogis who were part of the foundation of the Hatha yoga tradition. I just wanted to give an example of some of these because some of the yamas and niyamas 
are the same as we find in Patanjali, but the other ones address the question of the and. It's like, this is good, and what do we need to function, not just in mo modern society, but to function in society as a whole, because the five yamas are just, are just not enough to guide your behavior. And this is where I, I have a problem with people with, you know, currently we try to give a foundation for ethics and yoga, particularly in therapy, as well as yoga in general, for yoga teachers, which involves very much interaction with the rest of the world. And they say, well, we have the yamas to guide us. And I have to say that's just not enough in guiding us in the complexity of dealing with other people, especially on the level of teacher, student, therapist, patient, and all of the other dynamics that come into play with those sort of human interactions. And so among the, uh, the yamas, you've got ahimsa, satyam, truthfulness and speech, asteya, which is temperance, or you know, you're not, no hankering for other people's possessions or property, uh, they do include, interestingly, brahmacharya is included as a yama here. And mm -hmm. that's that even has to be qualified at the time, because when you get into hatha yogis, there's always a discussion between whether celibacy is necessary or not necessary for spirituality. As an aside from my point, this is not just about yoga, but in all of human history, this equation of celibacy with spiritual purity has probably been the worst idea humanity has ever come up with because it's led to so much repression of energy. It's led to so much abuse. It's led to so much harm. We all know that the idea that if you're celibate, you're pure and ethical, it's just been disproven time and time again. And it's actually a corrupting force because of uh, the sublimation of energies. I just, that whole thing with celibacy is a big mistake. And, you know, and I, I would really like to add on to that, if I may, because we've talked about this before, and it's something that I think is so important for the, like, just for people, two people like you and me to be talking about this, because I cannot see in any psychobiological way that that idea to repress energy is not around this sort of I'm not sure if shame is the word I actually want to use, but the repression of the male fluid of semen of like how the, the, the physiological male body is designed to operate in this one particular context versus the female body is designed to operate. Because if, 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 if women had been at the table to discuss, okay, let's just talk about what like containment of energy means or repress, or, or whatever, there. it seems to me it would have been so much more like horizontalized and better considered because it would have been like, well, if we do want to keep going as a species, women are going to have to have a little bit of like expression of energy because where the baby's going to come from, you know? And and, and it, it just, to me, it just seems like this kind of up down, it's either going to go up or it's going to stay down, you know, sort of like idea versus a, a more holistic approach to the, to the different ways, the different types, the different you know moments in time when energy can be expressed or contained. You know, it, yeah. I guess I, I assume that's what you're saying, but yeah, it's just something that has. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll mention that there was a correlate to the female sexual fluid. They also argued that there's the same process that can take place in the female as in the male through bunda and that sort of thing. Though the male side was discussed more because more male practitioners. Okay. Overall, anybody versed in anatomy is going to question exactly what's the mechanism by which the fluid in your gonads is sent up into your brain and puts you in a state of samadhi. And my, I mean, it's just these are people not versed in anatomy. And and to me, it's, it's actually they're just talking about the wrong fluid. The, their insight is right. But if you look at it as the cerebrospinal fluid and how the rhythm of the breath uh, as well as holding a body in postures and going into deep relaxation, uh, all of this supports the pulsation of the cerebrospinal fluid, which does have an influence upon mental states. So I'm like that makes a lot more sense. But it's it's this almost instinctual equation of uh, sexuality and sexual energy with spiritual. That's where the mistake is made, and it just gets applied to the idea of fluid and the preservation of fluid. 
and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So we can do better, you know, and that understanding. Yeah, exactly. And it makes more sense. Yeah. So, it, it, and there were the Hatha yogis that spoke about it in a very physicalistic way, where the bindu is the actual sexual fluid. And then there were the Nati yogis who didn't talk about sexual fluid, they talked about Kundalini, which is more on an energetic level of harmonizing the masculine and feminine feminine within each individual and honoring right. that as being as, as being essential to our spiritual wholeness in that sense. But to go on, I mean, totally. so I mentioned those nonviolent, so on and so forth. Then you get to as a yama, kshama, which means forgiveness, forgiveness of the faults of others. You don't hear that in Patanjali, but if you're relating, if you're relating to anybody, uh, there has to be a certain level of forgiveness in your life as really a precept that you follow as a guiding light in dealing with other people. There's driti, which means patience coupled with fortitude, daya, compassion, or benevolence. These are a lot of the ands that are even left out by Patanjali at his time. It's like, yes, ahimsa and forgiveness, ahimsa and compassion, in which you're extending yourself to other people rather than simply demarcating yourself from your interaction with others. Uh, there's also uh, arjavam, which is simplicity, simplicity in life, mitahara, which is balance in your diet. Mitabok, hitabok is basically uh, following the middle path in your dietary restrictions, not too extreme to either side. And then socham, which is purity, uh, a pure mind and a pure body. And that was, that was treated in Patanjali's system as a niyama rather than a yama. Uh, when you get into the niyamas, how, yamas are how you regulate your behavior in relationship to other people. And Patanjali presents it as what you don't do. You don't create harm. You don't tell lies. You don't uh, covet other people's possessions. But you can see in this larger, this and aspect of the yamas, there are things that you positively do in relationship to other people, such as extending compassion, extending forgiveness. This is a, a precept that you follow in a positive way. Uh, when you get into the niyamas, niyamas refer to how you take care of yourself, how you take care of your own well-being. It's observances for your own well-being. And this includes tapas, santosha, contentment, uh, and then there are more cultural values like astikyam, faith in the Vedas, which is interpreted as faith in the Vedas or the Guru, which makes sense in the context of the culture then. Dana or charity, which recognizes the oneness of life and giving charity to others. Because life is one, when you take care of others, you take care of yourself. So charity is a way of honoring yourself in honoring or taking care of others without a sense of distinction between the two. So it's uh, you know, it doesn't exclude the self for the sake of selflessness. The self and and the selves of others are all come together in charity. And then there are other cultural values. There's Ishwara Pujanam, which is actual worship, which is different from, in a subtle sense, from Patanjali Ishwara Pranidhana, uh, which means to be... Essentially, it's being devoted to fulfilling the example of a particular purusha, as Patanjali describes it, which doesn't necessarily rec recognize an, a transcendent deity or God or spirit. It's really trying to uh, fulfill within yourself the example of another purusha. That's the Ishwar Pranidhana, to give your whole life's breath to fulfilling that. That's Patanjali here, Ishwar Pujanam, that's worship for the transcendent, for the self beyond the individual self. It's different, but of course, the bo the borders between Patanjali's meaning and the, the cultural meaning get blended after a while until people say, well, of course, Patanjali's talk about, talking about worshiping God, where at the time, Patanjali likely would have said, I have no idea what you're talking about. When you say that, that's not what I mean. Um, there are others, Siddhanta Vyakya Shravanam, which means hearing of the scriptures as interpreted especially by the Guru, um, and Hri, humility, which to feel, means to feel remorse at doing any wrong. That's how you take care of yourself, is to have that humility 
and recognize the times in which you have caused harm or done something wrongly and actually to feel some remorse at that, which is in important ways, it's worth contemplating how that's different from shame. Shame comes from the sense that I am irretrievably broken or imperfect or lesser or whatever. Shame is one thing, the humility by which I feel sorry for what I've done in the past and resolve to do better in the future. That's a very different thing. It's not the same. I mean, that would be in English. I think we would say, and where did this come from? But like there by the grace of God, go I. Yeah, right? exactly. Isn't that a little bit more, right? Yeah, it exactly. Like... And again, this is part of the culture of the time. And so Patanjali is giving us a short list where there is a much more robust list of, of values to follow that were available to the culture and got taken up later on by the Hatha yogis. Um, but again, that starts to shade into the culture, that culture, Vedic values of studying the Vedas, the necessity of a guru, things that you know, in, in 21st century America, if we presented that in yoga class, a lot of people in the class would say, wait a second, I'm, I'm not sure I want to go full Hindu here. But, you know, within Hindu society, this were Hindu values that were being propagated, which we can certainly appreciate, but we don't necessarily feel that we would follow those values for ourselves as presented because we're in a different time, a different culture and different people. So there's that difficulty of moral values, the deeper you get into it, the more you get into the social values of that particular culture. And this is what's happening with Dharma in the Bhagavad Gita too, because everybody is inspired by the idea of following your Dharma. But who defined Dharma at the time of the Bhagavad Gita? It was the cultural values as espoused by the Brahmins, which you wouldn't necessarily recognize as your Dharma today, because it was so much based upon the caste system. The next one I found really fascinating is called Mati, and that means to have the kind of intelligence that can reflect upon, understand, and reconcile conflicting ideas. It means being able to hold two opposing ideas in your mind at once and not have your mind be broken by that. It's like being able to see both sides of the issue and come to some understanding and appreciation of both sides and sort of reconcile themselves within your own mind without necessarily negating that contradiction. The ability to hold contradictory ideas is the basis of understanding because life is yeah, not I, black and white in that way. So I just want to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I think that's really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And certainly that would be... And I say that only because I'm, I, because I can't, it blows my mind. That that's, that that's a word, and that and that's, that's there, there, and that and that, that was a concept, concept in, in, in in Indian, Indian society, in Indian yeah, culture, yeah. In, in the 13th, 13th century. Uh, yeah, this is going back to the fourth or fifth century. Fourth or fifth. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure I place that. And so I so I want to ask, <laughs> you know, how amazing, amazing. that that, that word. word yeah. could be elevated right now, that concept be discussed within the yoga community, because, you know, not to, not to go so much, you know, we, we talked about Sean Korn before, you know, press record, and I'm going to bring her up again, because I've just, I haven't, I've had some contact with her over the years, but not as much as I did in the podcast, and I've just got a super crush at this point, and she, first of all, was talking about this in her early career, I just want to pin this really quick, this feeling of abundance. She was feeling abundance, you know, from all that, you know, she just hit like many teachers who exactly her age, just hit yoga teaching at the most perfect time. I mean, her career just blew up because yoga blew up and there she was like, yay. So this abundance she was feeling, she recognized, I want that abundance to keep flowing from me to others. So that concept of charity that you were talking about, this sort of abundance in self, I want to give back to abundance and other. And she's gone on to raise millions of dollars in order to serve others, which is just an incredible idea, particularly in the yoga world where there's, to be frank, not a lot of money flowing around. The second thing I want to say about this idea of two ideas at the same time, for yoga people listening to this call, what does it look like in your mind for a brain to be broken by not being able to hold two opposing or different truths? 
Yeah. I mean, I'll what say is that? two things. I mean, first of all, from my experience of living in, in, in India for seven years and for having a guru and, and listening to his teachings, that there is within Indian culture, as I felt or observed it, a comfort with contradiction. They're okay with that. Even, even the way Muktananda taught, sometimes he would, on one day he would say one thing, and the next day he would say the exact opposite and have no problem with it. Uh, because, you know, uh, to give an example, if he's encountered, uh, if he encounters somebody who's a little bit too ascetic in their approach to life and is sort of like self-denigrating, he would say, why do you hate the body so much? The, be- the body is a beautiful thing. It's a gift of God. Why don't you honor it? The next day you run in- he runs into somebody who enjoys life just a little bit too much. And he's like, why are you so attached to the body? The body's just a bag of piss and shit. What's the big deal about the body? And it's like, he was fine. And so he treated thought as medicine, as a corrective. If you're too much to one side or the other side of the spectrum, philosophical thought is a corrective for being too much on one extreme or the other. But when the brain gets broken, you tend to fall on one extreme and reject the opposite extreme and you can't handle it, you push it away and you don't attempt to understand it. And there is uh, an idea that I encountered, it was, it was somebody that Rachel Maddow was talking to a professor and it very much speaks to our time. He says, um, there's a methodology that people follow that's called reverse verification. Uh, so commonly, you know, to verify an idea, like even within the media, you hear an idea and then you go out to verify if it's true. You, you gain evidence before you say, this is what happened. You find out what really happened. You say, now I'm comfortable in saying this happened. Reverse ver- or verification in reverse is you take a commonly accepted idea, like everybody agrees to a certain idea, and then you call that into question or even openly deny it. And that creates such mental upset for people and generates so much energy that for a lot of people, they tend to gravitate towards the person denying the idea and will hold faithfully to that idea and reject any attempts to give evidence that the original idea was true. And I mean, yeah, that's a bro. And you see that in advertising, you know, on the internet, every ad is like, everything you've heard about this is not true. You know, and so it's like, what you've heard about carbs or what you've heard about this or that, it's not true, listen to me. And then you become faithful to the person who knows better than everybody else. And that's, that's, that's when we become polarized by that methodology. And that methodology is getting used more and more. It's actually by questioning an accepted truth that you actually create polarization because now you have a, two groups of people who don't listen to each, each other anymore. The one group says, there's all this evidence that this is true. Why aren't you listening? The earth is round, you know? And the other group is saying, I don't care what you're saying. You're just trying to fool me because I know what's really true because I know that's wrong. And that's when they stop communicating with each other. And that's that loss of mati, you know, cause I'm not saying never be skeptical. It's, it's one thing to be skeptical of ideas. It's another thing to deny a truth outright unless it's obviously, you know, untrue. It made me think about Descartes. Descartes thought that he could arrive at foundational truths by practicing doubt. And he said, if I call everything into doubt, what's the one foundational truth that I arrive at upon which I can build all other truth? And so he ends up with, I think, therefore I am, that famous saying there. (laughs) And then the people that came after him said, well, yeah, you can question that too. Because who is aware that you're thinking, is that really you? And, it, right. and then you end up in this no man's land where all truth is called into question equally. And this is where people get manipulated. And so this, this element of how we take care of ourselves, niyama, through this, uh, this faculty of mati or intelligence means I can entertain opposing ideas without getting lost and i'm also less vulnerable to manipulation than to following a charismatic cult leader who says i have the truth i can fix everything everybody else is wrong which is deeply deeply attractive because 
it appeals to a sense of belonging. I want to belong to this truth because we're so tight, and it's you and me against the rest of the world sort of thing. It's, it's very, and again, when you get into dealing with other people, this is a way in which you take care of yourself in relationship to other people. So you maintain healthy boundaries and you're not manipulated by others by maintaining that faculty. That's something that's really kind of missing. If you look I mean, just at the it's I, Missing like in society. Yeah, period, it's like it needs to be mentioned. That. It's not like Patanjali <laughs> lacked that. It's like you really need to mention this. <laughs> it's pretty Well, important. I actually, it's not only, it's not only that, you know, not we wish he mentioned it, but yeah. there's two questions I have as we, <laughs> you know, as I respect your time. Although, can you just come talk to me every quarter or so? Can <laughs> we do this again? Because I feel like this conversation just keeps rolling. We keep, yeah. you know, sort of peeling back the layer of the onion with more. And so I guess one question I have is, and I keep thinking about this with regard to this modern yoga, this sort of and space that we're filling out, which I think you've done such a great job with these words. And in the show notes, um, I, I, you know, to the extent Anchor gives me that space, we have like a word limit, but we made maybe we'll just do a link off because this is what we did for your last one. It, it was such a long summary. We had to put it on some Word doc or Google Doc or something. But um, with the sutras, as this, like cohering for us, this kind of point in time, you, you, and, and it, it may be um, distracting for me to, to ask this question. So bat it away if it's not sort of worth it. Because I think what you've successfully done for me anyway, is help me understand this is through just for a moment in time. They were, a, a, you know, sort of a syn synthesizing document of a variety of different ways of thinking and it's from a coherent and it's from a coherent perspective because he is taking a particular perspective from the level of samkhya which is what part of what makes us it's so clear and powerful right and, and let's let's pull that out just for a second because from the point of view of samkhya making it coherent and and powerful that is because it is about the human being sort of tending to their mind as best as possible internally. That's what Samkhya essentially is. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, first of all, I'm, he's kind of clear that this is for people who are interested in dealing with the mind. It's like everybody else is, this is for the person who wants to be a yogi. It's not, he's right. not proselytizing to the world that everybody should do this, but he's like, if you want to be a yogi, follow this yeah. path. And I kind of regretted by when I said it's like you wish he had said it about Monty. It didn't fit into the philosophy. He didn't say it because it That's didn't exactly fit into right. that perspective. So that would be a tangent or a kind of non sequitur to get into that. And it would be a not, yeah, and that, that's exactly what I want to get at. It would be a non sequitur because Monty in that case would, that being redundant here, would be a non sequitur because Monty is about how you see stay sort of stable, mentally stable in the context of competing ideas that are coming at you from the outside that you are validating by virtue of them being from the outside, which in the Samkhya Sutra philosophy aren't really as being from the outside, aka property that valid because property is the thing that yeah. won't ever change and you don't really want to deal with if you're going to be a yogi. Yeah. I mean, Samkhya is basically based upon the insight, which is influenced very much by those philosophies from the East, that intellectually you need to make a very clear distinction between who you are as a self, which is unchanging and not influenced by time. This is your eternal self or your eternal soul, and everything that constitutes the body, which includes the mind and your processes of thought, your emotions, all of that is constantly changing as, and is not really you because it is always constantly changing. You are not who you were five years ago or 10 years ago because that's property that's not really you. But as long as you consider that to be you, you get attached to that and then you experience suffering because you experience loss. You experience inevitably over the course of time, everything that you value at one point or another will be taken away from you. 
And that's to Patanjali, that's almost the definition of discrimination. At one point, he clearly says, Viveka discrimination is recognizing that everything in your life that you value will ultimately cause you pain because you will lose it. He doesn't elaborate that fully, but everything in this world is a source of pain, ultimately. And once you make that discrimination between the eternal self, which is untouched by the world, and the self that we think to be our self, the mental, physical self, which is constantly buffeted about by the world, uh, once you disassociate from that self or recognize that's not really you and you can let it go, then you will be free from suffering. You'll be free from pain. And the whole point is to free you from suffering because that's the essential project of Samkhya is freedom from suffering on all levels. Ayurveda teaches you how to become free from or experience less suffering in the body. Uh, Patanjali, as a, a branch of Samkhya, is how you become free from suffering in the mind and even suffering in the spirit, ultimately through achieving mm-hmm. Samadhi. And so okay. the interesting thing is, can you handle a different concept of yoga? Do you have people that say, Patanjali is yoga and everything else is not yoga. Well, that's one concept of yoga, but the Hatha Yogi say it's this, which in many ways contradicts what Patanjali is saying on some level. Can you handle that and reconcile it? Or do you take a stand and say, I will only follow this path and not listen to anything else, meaning I will only follow Patanjali, for instance, and not under- entertain other ideas of yoga? Or can we handle incorporating how the whole concept of yoga is evolves over time. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing meta sort of idea that in one side of your unbroken brain, you'd have Patanjali's exposition on yoga. And in the other side of your unbroken brain, you've got this other stuff, you know, and maybe with Mati at the yeah. center. So the kind of meta exercise would be to keep your brain unbroken by holding those two yeah. separate Truths, right? I mean, it's it's part of what was going on with the tantrics because earlier you were saying these tantric right. yogis in relation that was their rebellion against the the British Empire. And I would say, uh, on some level, that's true. I can see that happening. And prior to the British Empire, uh, tantra was actually originally before it became before it influenced Hatha yoga was a rebellion against the cultural thinking, the the sort of cultural thinking of India itself because. I think I was saying last time too, they said, if you base your desire on liberation uh, from karma upon following the rules of Dharma, like was taught in the Bhagavad Gita, with the threat that if you break the rules or break Dharma, you will have a worse incarnation or go to hell or whatever. Many people say this today too. The, The Tantric said that's a whole spirituality based upon fear. It's fear of going to hell or fear of reincarnation. And so they, in being transgressives, were, were, were teaching you break the rules to get over the rules. And so the way that they dressed was not just to offend the British. It was actually to get, it was to offend other people in their own society, to walk around naked or have ashes on your body. People are like, eh, what are you doing? Even with an Indian culture, and it was a way of getting over being attached to what other people think about how you present yourself, even within Indian culture, before the British ever re- arrived. And the tantrics are saying you have to get over that in order to get out of this black and white thinking of spirituality, that this is pure and that's impure. It all is. It's all life. It's pure and impure mixed together. Concepts of pure and impure our concepts and our mind, and the more strongly we distinguish them, the more we hold ourselves back from the totality of what really is. And so it is a rebellion, and they went a little bit too far <laughs> in a number of yeah. directions, but it's, it's again, freeing up the mind to the ability to be accepting while holding contradictories without coming down and taking a strong stand. And you know, it's, yeah. Obviously, well, that's, and, that's happening in our polarized culture right now, where it's a political tool to attack the vulnerable in our culture, uh, to, to write laws against, you know, everything that laws are being written against in Florida right now. That's that kind of, it's not just a question of intolerance. 
It's an in-question of the mind being unable to tolerate somebody else being different from you and not following the very narrow set of norm of values of normalcy that you define as normal. Anybody outside of that range of normal, you reject and even legislate against. That's what's broken in our mind right now, the inability to accept others in that way. I mean, it's a it's it, it it's a it's an inability to accept what is what is. That can't I mean what they're trying to legislate against cannot be changed and has been before they ever had the idea that it was good or bad. And the weaponizing of politics in that way is just, it's just, it's so sad. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a form of that verification in reverse, which creates exactly. a cultish mentality. But you know, yeah. people that say, either you're a man or you're a woman, it has to be either, so make a choice. Anybody who studies science or nature would say, have you looked at nature lately? I mean, exactly. there's a spectrum. It's right. not black and white and sexuality exactly. or anything else like that. And so, again, it's, it's a rejection of what we already know to be true based upon nature and a reference back to our reading of previous spiritual texts to validate this kind of rejection going on. Uh, and mm -hmm. again, this is this is not how we take care of ourselves mentally or emotionally to fall into this sort of trap. It is how you create a cult, a cult uh, mm -hmm. and, and and again, draw people into the sense of belonging. I wanted to mention the last two because some people are like, what are the last oh, two? Oh, yeah. Last right. two oh, niyamas. Sorry, yeah. uh, one is japa, repetition of mantra. That's implicit in Patanjali in talking about om, but um, it's much more clearly sensed said here and of course then that's a cultural value that's uh particularly to the mm -hmm. indian culture which we can adopt mm -hmm. uh and then the last of is huta which is a, a practice of offering of sacrifices meaning offering up your food or your drink it's like we say grace at the table it's that sense of offering back to god what you receive into your body uh, again within how that's defined culturally for them um, but again, that's that's more a positive sense of how you maintain your own health and well-being as, while living in the body as a human being. So that mm -hmm. kind of completes the list. And I think, you know, as we <clears throat> encounter other forms of social interaction, like the internet, social media, I mean, the list of the end needs to expand in understanding how we relate to others especially when there's not a personal face-to-face -face interaction. Now we interact mm -hmm. simply through words in real time, you know, through social media and everything else like that, not even through books like it was in the past where somebody would write a book and somebody would write a review and they go back and forth in a sort of rational way. Now we're caught up in how we interact with others and even how what we read into their words when they write something and how we interpret emotionally what yeah. they're saying. Uh, it, it just involves a lot more uh, evolution in our understanding of how to react, how to relate to each other in a way that is healthy for us and healthy for the others. And of course, that's the big problem of social media right now is become so toxic and so unhealthy, especially for our youth. We're trying to figure out what are the values that we need now to understand how to navigate this new way of relating. You know, all of this falls entirely outside of the purview of what Patanjali would talk about, because Patanjali would say, well, get off of Facebook. What are you doing? Right. <laughs> you know, you right. Know. Exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, he would, he would basically just say Facebook is property, property and, therefore, and therefore, yeah. you know, a, a, a point of suffering, so don't do it. it yeah. And certainly, certainly a lot of people would say, well, yeah, that's good advice. Get off of Facebook. Definitely. But you can't entirely absent yourself from all the forms of interaction and communication that we have today. It's like, yeah, you could get off of social media, but that hasn't entirely solved the problem. Unless you go into yeah. a meditation, unless you go into the woods and sit in a meditation cabin, in which case you're back to Patanjali's solution. It's fine. Right. Which is not, I mean, not practical advice for anyone who has children who's yeah. paying a mortgage who's trying to live in the world and even use technologies like you we're using right now to communicate with one another and to share and to learn and to grow 
um, in any way, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I've said it in the past, I think I got it from my teachers, like the isolated spirituality of the meditation cave is relatively easy. When spirituality gets really difficult, that's when you have to interact with others. It's when you have to go down from the mountain and go to the grocery store. Oh my God. Well, or just get some dirty socks off the floor, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. Like my son walks out of the house and I'm like, are you actually gonna wear that to school? <laughs> I could probably say that a little more nicely. Yeah. Like for example, and... when was the last time you showered? <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I think I mean if we if that was entirely negated from our lives, I think we'd miss it a little bit because it's part of the joy of the messiness of of living. That's part of the beauty of life too, and to well, think that you can entirely absent yourself from it, something would be lost. Oh, I mean, I think that's like maybe maybe that's a great place to end because something may be lost is like an understatement. It seems to me, and I would like to say that if we can pick up on this in a few months. If you've got the time, I would love to like next chapter of this conversation be around the, you know, because I, I don't want to have told you this before I, we press record, but I talked to Eddie Stern a couple days ago, right before talking to Sean. And, you know, he, he led with, and this is what, you know, people who hear this will hopefully have already listened to it because I'm releasing his before I release yours. Um, you know, the sort of maturity of the Western mind and, and specifically of the American mind versus the maturity of the sort of minds east of the dateline. And I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing and not trying to criticize anybody, but we're pretty young. I mean, we're kind of babies in terms of being a nation state and in terms of being, you know, a, a, a culture that needs whatever it needs to thrive and survive. And it seems to me we're in, as Sean and I were talking about yesterday, really living in trauma in this post COVID place where all communities are sort of confused and, you know, in this maybe broken space that we've been discussing in this yeah. talk. And I just, I'm continuously with every one of these conversations driven to figure out how we can share these rich teachings yeah. of yoga, which feel so good and are so smart to help, just to help. <laughs> how I about mean, it makes, this way? When you say that, it makes me think of how, I mean, our reaction to this trauma is in different ways. We're retreating back into concepts of foundation of values where it's, it's all about which amendment we're talking about, First Amendment, Second Amendment, or right. Christian values, which are actually no Old Testament values right. regarding sexuality and stuff like that. Yeah, what would so, Jesus say about that, guys? Yeah, yeah, we're retreating into found not just foundational values, but our interpretation of foundational values, which right. validates the stance that we're taking, saying you're wrong, I'm right, and it becomes that 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 sort of separated worldview. I mean, my understanding or my perspective on how yoga philosophy evolved is. There, and th this happens over centuries, there's a clear presentation of a set of ideas, and then it gets contemplated over time, especially as there are efforts made to put it into practice. I think potentially fell, fell out of favor after 500 years because it is so hard to put into practice and live life at the same time. So there's always that moment of criticism, which is not a rejection of the philosophy that came before Rather, it's saying, what did we leave out? What, what uh, aspect of our lives is not being addressed by this philosophy? And this is always the question of and. It's like that philosophy is good, and how can we flesh it out more so it embraces all of the different dimensions of our life and speaks to every dimension in a way that allows us to enhance how we live rather than retreat into some value uh, some set of values out of a fear of what's happening in life. And that's, right. that's the moment of, uh, that's how yoga philosophy matures and develops over time. It's not a rejection of I, one idea and replacing it with another. It's elaborating upon an idea and adding what's missing. Uh, and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, and we have to kind scary. of be with that process and, and recognize the challenges that come to it at each point in time 
that are not challenges that people faced before, or at least not in the same way or to the same degree. And when we say, I think he's right, we're relatively young as a culture in the United States, and young in the sense that we're holding to values that were set forth 200 years ago, more than 200 years ago, not followed perfectly. I mean, when they wrote We the People, you know, in the Constitution, they weren't talking about women. They weren't talking about people who were enslaved. They were talking about white men with property, <laughs> basically. And so it's like, it's, we're still in the process of filling out exactly how genuine we are in saying we the people, how inclusive we are. And so that's, that's a process of maturity and growing up that's taking place for us as a nation. But it's also the general process of the evolution of our understanding of living, which we could call yoga philosophy. And what makes it yoga philosophy is a focus upon how to make our attitude towards life the most fulfilling to us and how we can put that practice into un how we can put that practice into understanding so that becomes real for us, that becomes true for us. Uh, and yoga is centered around practice, but it's that vision that guides the practice. And that's how the practice evolves over time including practicing with other people, you know, like that. That is the best place to end. And I have a list of things that I think we should go deep on whenever you're available next. <laughs> Always look yeah, forward Doug to Keller. That. Oh my God. Thank you so much for all of the time. Love the extra flowers in the background. I hope the people on the podcast can't see it, but you should go to YouTube and watch because they look so cute with the lights and the stuff. In the flowers. Thank you so much. This is my old basement retreat down here. <laughs> I love it. I know. I wish we'd heard the dogs barking. I think my my puppy successfully ripped to shreds a shreds of rug while we yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much.